All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the first event in our Environmental Justice Speaker Series. This series is hosted by CU Boulder Society of Environmental Engineers in collaboration with the Environmental Engineering Program, the Bold Center, and CU Boulder's chapters of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. I would now like to hand it over to the Director of the Environmental Engineering Program, Professor Fernando Rosario Ortiz, for some more introductions. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the EVN program, I would like to welcome you to this new seminar series, which has an emphasis on uh, environmental justice. The environmental engineering program has the main goal of preparing students to face the current environmental challenges. And we view this goal to include not only the technical aspects of a profession, but also to train our students to deal with some of the larger components of these issues, including consideration of environmental justice. Therefore, these seminars are an important component of our mission to train our students, in this case, by bringing in excellent speakers that can share with us their work in this area. I'd like to thank the students for organizing this event. This was solely organized by them, and, that and I wanna thank specifically Abigail, Julia, Eliza, Cole, Lee, and others um, that were involved, also Professor Jenna Milford, and the Associate Director for Undergrad Studies and Environmental Engineering, and Laurence Lambert, also an EVN for the leadership created in these events. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Julia. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce you to Dr. Dickinson. She is an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Public Health. Her background in environmental economics makes her an expert in human response to environmental health risks. I would also like to remind everyone to put their questions in the Q&A window below so that they can be answered at the end of her presentation. Dr. Dickinson, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to hearing about your work. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, and thanks for organizing this series. I'm really um, excited to um, kick it off and to uh, stay tuned for, for the other uh, events you've got planned. So uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, as Julia said, I'm Katie Dickinson and I'm an assistant professor in the Environmental and Occupational Health Department on the CU Anschutz campus in the School of Public Health. And today I'm gonna talk about the work that I do um, specifically related, related to environmental justice and oil and gas development in Colorado. Um, I'm hoping that um, as Julia said, I encourage you to put your questions in the chat. I'm, I'm uh, planning to, to leave some good time to, to have a discussion uh, with all of you. working here. So though I actually am um, uh, from Colorado originally, I was born um, in Boulder, uh, I want to acknowledge that I'm a relative newcomer to this, um, to the state and to this land. And I'm giving this talk from the ancestral lands of the Sioux, Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. Um, I think this acknowledgement is particularly important given the, given the content of today's talk, which deals with ongoing questions about how our lands are used and who has a say in these decisions. I think it's particularly important also to acknowledge the leading role that Indigenous people continue to play in contemporary environmental justice fights around oil and gas development um, in Colorado and across the country. So of course, uh, many of us are um, familiar with the Dakota Ac Access pipe Pipeline um, uh, issue and the, the um, you know, ongoing fight of the Standing Rock Sioux in that case. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that, you know, right here in Colorado, we have folks like Ian Tafoya, who are really, again, leading the way on environmental justice work ar around um, a wide range of issues, including, uh, again, the environmental, uh, the oil and gas issues that I'll talk about today. Um, so I think it's really important, important to, to um, acknowledge and, and follow the lead of, of, um, of these leaders in these issues. I also want to acknowledge that I'm actually relatively rare to the study of oil and gas um, issues in Colorado. So um, I am I'm still learning a lot. Um, as, uh, as Julia mentioned, I have a background in environmental economics and I've studied a wide range of different environmental health topics. Um, but oil and gas is something that I've been studying for the last uh, three or four years and I have really benefited from um, great collaborations with um, the folks in my department. So Lisa uh, John and Ben um, have really done a lot of the pioneering work documenting the, the human health impacts um, of oil and gas development for um, communities that are located in proximity to these areas. Um, Natalie Binakos is my um, professional research assistant who has played a key role in 
um, in developing these projects and getting us um, getting us going with the, the work that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, at CU Denver, I collaborate with Desiree Crow, who's a, a good friend of mine from grad school and um, a professor in the School of uh, Public Affairs. So she focuses on environmental policy and um, is really, you know, in our work leading the way in thinking about these questions of, of participation and policy change and how that happens. Um, I also collaborate with uh, folks at the School of, Mind, Pete, uh, School of Mines. Pete Maniloff is a, an economist. Um, and Adrian uh, was really instrumental in getting this project off the ground. So in addition to those academic collaborators, uh, again, there are a lot of folks that are helping me to learn about this issue. Matt Samuelson is an environmental lawyer who's really guided me through the process of um, engaging in uh, the, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission's um, recent rulemakings that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I mentioned Ian, we're collaborating with folks at CDPHE, um, the Berkeley Environmental Justice Project, and then um, folks at uh, Logic, the League of Oil and Gas Impacted Coloradans as well. And then we have three um, academic advisors who are listed here as well. So I, again, just want to acknowledge um, this is absolutely a team effort and I'm, I'm still um, learning a lot about this from, from all the folks that I get to work with. So here's what I'd like to talk about today. I'm going to start by giving an overview of um, environmental justice. Uh, given that this is the first talk in your series, I know that you're, you know, many of you are probably already um, familiar with the, the concept of environmental justice. You might have your own definitions, but I think it's important to think about um, those definitions in different contexts. And also I'll give you kind of um, my framework of how, how I think about um, some of these issues and then specifically talk about how those apply in the context of um, oil and gas development here in Colorado. I'll talk about where we are and then also where we're headed next. Um, let's see if I can hold on a second. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, environmental justice is, uh, again, many different definitions, but I like to start with uh, Robert Bullard, who is known as the father of environmental justice. Um, he says that environmental justice embraces the principle that all people have a right to equal protection and equal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations. Uh, he no notes that America is still quite segregated, and so is pollution. Um, today's uh, zip code is uh, really predictive of environmental um, outcomes and uh, health and well-being. And so reducing environmental health and economic disparities um, is a major priority of the environmental justice movement. And I think it's important to acknowledge that environmental justice is both an academic um, enterprise, right? The, this, some of the things that I'll talk about today in terms of studying who is exposed and um, who uh, benefits from different um, environmental um, situations, uh, but also it, it's a movement, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a social movement. And so I think as an academic, thinking about how I engage um, in both of those enterprises is, uh, is really uh, important. So since 1994, the US Environmental Protection Agency has acknowledged um, that environmental justice is a uh, priority issue. And I've put their definition here. There are two key components to this de definition. So the first is distributive justice. And this is the idea that the burdens of environmental pollution and the benefits of a clean environment should be distributed fairly across society. The second is procedural justice, and this is the idea that all people should have an equal opportunity to participate in decision-making processes that affect their environments. So of course we know that in practice, um, all people do not un universally enjoy distributive or participatory environmental justice, so I'll provide just a few examples. Um, this is a recent study that found that Blacks in the US are exposed to 21% more particulate matter pollution um, than white, Amer than white uh, US residents, while their consumption accounts for 23 less emissions than the population average. So whites are causing more pollution but are exposed to less of it than non-white residents. 
At the same time, white communities also tend to enjoy better access to positive environmental features like parks that can make people healthier. Um, this unequal distribution is not an accident, but is a direct result of historical patterns of discriminatory land use and housing policies. On the question of procedural justice, there are lots of barriers that prevent people from fully participating in decisions that affect their local environment. In Colorado, one relevant set of environmental risks, um, which is the topic of today's talk, is related to um, the recent boom in oil and gas extraction. So laws around mineral rights affect who gets to participate in decisions and how they participate. For example, under the policy of forced pooling, a company that owns mineral rights um, can go forward with drilling as long as the majority of owners in an area agree to lease their rights. So in this context, um, I think, you know, it's really important to acknowledge these structural drivers of environmental injustice or environmental racism. Um, in, uh, you know, in, in this context, in a lot of contexts, I think in, in many conversations that hopefully a lot of you have been involved in and sort of unpacking racism um, more generally in society, I think one thing, thing theme that's really important to um, acknowledge is that um, impact and intent are, are two separate things. And we can have an action or a policy that um, is racist or has a racist impact, even if that's not the, the intention of the policy. I really like this book. This is a, a recommended reading um, for thinking about, um, for learning about the environmental justice movement and also for thinking about sort of a conceptual framework for environmental racism and environmental justice. And so they emphasize that it's important to identify those structural, economic, and social forces that are, uh, that are influencing outcomes and also to isolate the decision-making processes and dynamics. They also emphasize, again, this is the point where, you know, just be, you know, sort of thinking of ourselves as sort of these dispassionate, um, objective um, academics, you know, doesn't always work in, in this context because there are uh, real questions of um, sort of moral um, uh, outcomes and what's right. And so uh, another piece of this work is, is engaging with that and thinking about um, how do we evaluate those structural forces um, that are contributing to, to disparities um, and, and how do we um, identify pathways that, that might reduce those disparities and empower uh, disadvantaged communities. So that's the way I think about environmental justice kind of in a broad sense. And uh, I would like to transition now to talking about oil and gas extraction um, and uh, you know, this important issue um, in Colorado. So I've gotten involved um, in this issue through a team, as I mentioned earlier, and um, specifically um, some of the, the members of our team have been um, for a while thinking about what do we know? We, you know? Is there an environmental justice issue when it comes to uh, oil and gas development in Colorado? So past work that our team has done um, has addressed this in a few ways. In uh, 2016, um, some of our team members um, published this paper that uh, found, looked at patterns of oil and gas development and found that in some areas, lower value homes tend to be closer to wells. Um, we've also conducted a review of the literature that found uh, mixed evidence about whether oil and gas development tends to occur near socially disadvantaged communities. And this is due in part to some methodological issues across studies, including an issue that involves uh, spatial scale. So, you know, where are we measuring um, at the, uh, at the neighborhood level, at the census tract, at the census block group level, group level um, and all of those uh, methodological choices actually have an impact on how, uh, what answers we find here. And so I'll get into that in uh, just a minute when we talk about um, our study here as well. So one um, kind of key uh, topic to, uh, you know, understand when we're thinking about this issue of uh, environmental justice and oil and gas in Colorado is this um, technological process called hydraulic fracturing. Um, many I'm sure are familiar with the, um, uh, with fracking as um, a concept, but um, until I started this work, I didn't really know what fracking was. And, and um, I am also not an engineer. I know I'm talking to a lot of engineers in the audience. So I'll give my very, um, you know, um, simplified uh, sort of cartoon version here. But the, the basic difference is that in uh, sort of conventional oil and gas development, um, using vertical drilling, if you have, uh, you know, an oil and gas resource that's located in a particular place, you don't drill, you know, you, you 
um, pick a, a drill spot that's above that location and you drill directly down into that, into that resource. With hydraulic fracturing, um, you actually can, can drill, uh, you drill down and then vertically and then uh, horizontally um, to, um, to reach the resource. And one of the things that that allows you to do is actually have um, flexibility in siting of those wells, um, because you can make, reach that same resource from, from multiple different locations. So that actually creates a potential for, um, um, you know, again, more flexibility in siting, which, which from an environmental perspective could be good or bad, right? If you could, um, you, for example, choose to, to locate in an area that has a lower impact, um, that, that might be a positive. Um, on the other hand, if there are forces that say, you know, there's more resistance to, to drilling in one area, maybe that pushes you to another area where there's less resistance, protect, potentially because that area has less, uh, you know, economic or, or political power. Um, and so um, this, you know, this, in, again, this technological innovation has really um, accelerated the pace of, um, of drilling in Colorado. Um, this is just another graphic that shows how uh, the resource, um, what kind of what, what um, hydraulic fracturing looks like. So again, you can see that, you know, these, there's, there's sort of a, a wide field of um, different uh, um, uh, resources that can be access from a, from a given spot. Oh, and the other, the other thing that this does is create the potential for larger well pad sites because you, again, you can sort of have, as, you, as this uh, picture nicely shows, you can, you can have sort of one uh, well pad reaching resources across a wide, um, a, a wide scale. Um, as of 2014, more than 17 million people in the US were living within a half mile of an oil and gas well. Um, and um, that there were about 380,000 people in Colorado that were living within a half mile of a well. Most of those wells, about half of those wells um, at the U.S. scale were um, drilled since 2000. And if this little graphic will run, we can see just sort of this pace of acceleration in, um, in well development in uh, northern Colorado. So you can see the, the writing's small here, but this is Fort Collins, Longmont, here's Greeley. Um, and so it's clear just how, how rapidly um, this graph is showing between 1990 and, and 2013, but the um, you know, drilling continued past that point. So there's been a lot of uh, acceleration. So I mentioned this phenomenon uh, where you know, multiple um, sites are possible because, because there is this flexibility in siting with, with, um, with hydraulic fracturing. And so this particular example is one you may have heard of. It was, um, it's gotten a lot of coverage, including by um, all of our favorite um, news source, The Daily Show. Um, and, you know, this is kind of that textbook example of, of environmental racism. There was a proposed site that was near um, a school that was um, predominantly white, the parents organized, and the, um, the company opted to move the site to uh, a site right, right uh, kind of bordering the Bella Romero Academy, which is 80% um, students of color, high proportion of, of non-English speaking students. Um, so I think this really highlights, right, this, this sort of, again, textbook case of, you know, when, when um, well-resourced and, uh, you know, communities that, that sort of have that political voice are able to say, not in my backyard, um, uh, very loudly, then, then that development can get pushed into other communities. And so, you know, our team has been interested in, in sort of looking at, at a broader scale across the state, you know, is this just kind of one um, really egregious case, or do we see um, more persistent patterns of this kind of um, phenomenon? Another thing that I want to highlight um, here uh, is that, you know, these health, when, when we're thinking again about sort of the benefits and burdens, the health risks of, um, of uh, oil and gas development really are greatest for those that live in closest proximity to oil and gas wells. And again, this is a lot of work that um, other folks in my department in the School of Public Health have been doing. Um, so there's, you know, these are really intensive operations. This is another, you know, really big difference between um, this kind of development and more traditional um, conventional oil and gas development is just, again, the scale of these, that these really do become large industrial sites. And so there's, you know, months of, of development of, of heavy truck traffic, um, noise, light, and um, uh, there's sort of a, a, a wide range of studies that um, my colleagues and others have done documenting um, impacts on, uh, on public health 
um, through exposure primarily to, to air pollutants, plus again, noise and, and light pollution are, are also um, key concerns. And meanwhile, it's not necessarily the case that all of the economic benefits are going directly to those communities. Um, they are going to the you know, folks who, um, who own the, the companies and um, to those who own the mineral rights who aren't necessarily the same people who, um, who own the surface rights or who, or who are living on, on the land. Um, finally, when we're thinking about these oil and gas um, environmental justice um, intersections, um, I, I really like to highlight the work that my colleague Sarah Wiley at Northeastern has done. Um, her, her another uh, recommended reading here for your reading list, um, her book Fractivism is, is fantastic. Um, and she talks about one of the things that she really highlights is these large asymmetries between the information that um, oil and gas companies have um, and uh, the dearth of information about the health impacts of their, uh, of their activities. So, so she, you know, talks about how, um, you know, just the, the wide sort of scientific and, and technical data that go into these siting decisions that go into um, developing the mixes of, um, of chemicals that are used in the fracking operations um, and meanwhile, uh, these companies have been fairly successful, very successful in, um, in really, you know, blocking a lot of the, uh, the science to, um, to measure the, uh, the health impacts of, of what they're doing. Um, again, those, that, that sort of fracking fluid is a, is a key example. So this um, organization called Frack Focus um, has been trying to uh, publicize uh, the disclosures around um, around fracking fluid mixes. Um, so companies are able to argue that these are, you know, propri proprietary um, uh, data for, for, their, um, for their operations. And so oftentimes it's very difficult for communities to know exactly what chemicals are being used right in their, you know, right in their backyards. Um, so again, both of these, the sort of fract fractivism, um, frac focus, these are both um, sort of attempts to democratize that um, information. They use citizen science, science types approaches um, to help communities create platforms that, um, that make these, the, this information more public um, and try and, and uh, level that playing field to document um, the environmental and human health impacts of these, um, of these operations. So I'm going to switch gears now a little bit and talk about uh, the, some of the work that our group is um, just getting underway and how that intersects with recent policy changes or ongoing policy changes that are happening at the state level. So we, um, in uh, 2018, we, um, or I guess in uh, 2019, we were awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation um, and we're just uh, just now getting started. We had some delays in, in actually getting the funded due to, due, due to COVID. Um, but this is our basic study design. So we have three main research questions that are trying to target both distributive and procedural justice questions about oil and gas development in Colorado. So our conceptual model here shows how patterns of proximity to oil and gas wells um, are shaped by decisions at different scales. So there are uh, individuals um, who make decisions about where to live, um, based in part on, on the information that they have about um, uh, the, the potential impacts um, and even their, you know, just knowing how close they are to, to oil and gas um, development activities. Um, clearly there are oil and gas operators making decisions about where to site their operations, housing developers also building, um, and there are some, some, you know, policy differences. There are actually differences in the um, setback between, you know, how close uh, oil and gas well operator is allowed to build to an existing home. Um, that's you know currently 500 feet, whereas uh, a housing developer, um, this actually varies a lot across the state, but in, in some places it's as, as little as 250 feet um, that a housing developer can build to an existing well. Um, and so there's some key policy differences there. Um, there's a lot of engagement of advocacy organizations in this space, and I'll highlight a little bit, bit of that as we go as well. Um, and then, of course, all of this is sort of interacting with this policy and regulatory um, landscape to um, determine how these processes move forward and then ultimately, you know, who is in proximity to, to development. So with this framework in mind, we are asking questions about distributive justice. We're asking about 
whether socially disadvantaged groups in Colorado are more likely to be in proximity to oil and gas development. We're also asking questions about procedural justice um, around uh, what information different uh, homeowners have when they purchase homes um, and how those affect housing choices and also how a policy change, um, namely SB 181 that I'll talk about in just a moment, um, potentially increase or uh, changes some of these, um, these dynamics in this landscape. So to first talk about that distributive justice question, um, what we plan to do is to use multiple spatial data sets to look at um, both you know, characteristics of the population, well locations, and um, uh, so, so yeah, population density, well locations, and um, various population characteristics such as race, um, race ethnicity, and, uh, income, um, uh, language uh, isolation, um, and various other factors. So I mentioned earlier that one trick, uh, one, one uh, issue that we run into with this work is that um, what we really want to know, right, is if, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, you know, the health impacts particularly really accrue to those who are in closest proximity, so within 1,000, 2,000 feet of, of those wells. And um, at the same time, the publicly available data sets that we have are um, at, for example, the census block group level, which is a larger, um, you know, sort of an aggregate level um, of data. So we might know that, you know, for this area, there on average, you know, it is, you know, 50% white, 50% non-white. Um, we might know the average income level, but, you know, we don't know exactly who within that area is, um, is located in close proximity to, to wells. Um, and so uh, we're, we're addressing this in, a, in a, a few different ways. So one is that um, through uh, the, um, there's a restricted data, uh, census data center um, located at CU Boulder. And so we have uh, team members who are working on getting access to that, those data. And through that, we can actually get finer scale data um, to look at um, the American Community Survey um, and, and to actually be able to then, you know, more closely um, uh, correlate the, the well locations and the, the characteristics of folks that are actually in closest proximity to those wells. We're also using two other data sets, and one is um, the Colorado birth record data set. So what that allows us to do, we're actually not looking at the birth outcomes, but what we have is a, uh, a data set that includes all women who gave birth over a particular period of time. We know their addresses and their, um, several of their demographic characteristics. So that doesn't allow us to get to the entire population, but for the subset um, of the population um, that is you know, women who gave birth over uh, a certain period of time, we can look at, at, at those correlations between, um, again, their characteristics and their proximity to wells. Um, and then the final data set that we're gonna be using um, is looking at schools. And we think this is a very relevant data set. Um, so for schools, we can look at how close they are to, um, so the school itself, how close it is to, um, to wells. And um, through the Department of Education, we can gather data on, um, you know, the percent free and reduced lunch, um, percent English, um, English as a first language or a second language, um, various different characteristics. And again, I think that's, that's relevant both because those schools are capturing the characteristics of the you know, surrounding neighborhoods, but also because kids who are particularly vulnerable um, to some of the health effects uh, are spending a lot of time in those, uh, under normal circumstances, right, in a pre-COVID, uh, hopefully post-COVID world, spending a good period of, those, of their time in those, um, in those locations. So those are some of our, um, you know, what we hope to do is be able to use multiple different spatial data sets to answer this question and see if we get consistent answers or inconsistent answers. So it's sort of helping us to sort of methodologically assess um, kind of how the way that we ask the question affects the answer that we get in terms of, you know, for example, uh, are there more oil and gas wells uh, located in proximity to um, non-white communities or um, communities of color in, in the state? So meanwhile, actually, we had a, an interesting um, uh, turn of events. This not not this particular um, uh, tragic event that I'm that I'm alluding to or that I'm showing here. The Firestone expo explosion in April of 2017 um, precipitated uh, a 
kind of a renewed wave of activism. Um, this also coincided, this timing coincided with um, the 2018 um, uh, elections where the uh, Colorado legis or, you know, government um, flipped from, from a, uh, you know, the uh, Republicans having control of uh, the House to, um, or to the, sen the Senate, I believe, um, to having all three branches controlled by, by Democrats, which created kind of this, pol this opening for, um, for a policy shift. And so there was a lot of activism, various different groups were involved. Um, I mentioned Ian's work, um, a lot of, of real, um, you know, uh, activism and, and um, legal action that, that was really pushing this forward. Some of you might have remembered um, Prop 112, um, which was on the ballot in 2018 um, and would have uh, increased setbacks um, across the state to um, 2,500 um, feet. And uh, this failed, but it actually was, was quite close. It was, um, I can't remember exactly the, the breakdown, but I think uh, this sort of showed that there was um, some uh, momentum and appetite um, um, for, for this work. And so in, um, in the spring of 2019, um, uh, Governor Polis was able to sign a bill that uh, the legislature passed called SB 181. Uh, which did several different things and, and, and really created a massive um, seismic shift in the way that oil and gas is regulated in the state. So it changed, for, for one thing, um, one of the things that it did is it changed the mission of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So prior to um, SB 181, the mission was to um, foster oil and gas resource development um, in a manner consistent with uh, protecting public health. Um, however, SB 81 shifted that so that the focus is now on regulating the industry in a manner that protects public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. So it really prioritizes um, uh, that, that regulation and, and protection of public health. Um, it also gives local governments more control over oil and gas siting decisions. So what we, um, we actually, uh, what I was kind of alluding to earlier is that we actually submitted this grant for the first time in 2017 fall 2017 um, and then uh, this was SB 181 um, uh, or I guess we submitted the first time in, in 2019 and then or, I'm getting all confused 2018 uh, and then SB 181 passed and then we, we resubmitted in 2019 and um, we were able to uh, then re kind of focus our effort to look at how this policy shift is um, is going to affect um, affect procedural and distributional justice in the state. So um, in terms of procedural justice, I mentioned that there were sort of two, uh, among many other actually changes that, that SB 181 makes, there are two, two that I highlighted. And one is giving local um, areas more control over these siting decisions. So, so one of the things that motivated us to, to really focus on this in our, um, in our project is that we very quickly saw how different areas um, uh, fairly unsurprisingly responded quite differently to this new law. Um, this is a, a news article from um, July of 2019. So again, the, um, the uh, bill was passed in, in April of that year. And, um, and you know, very quickly, we saw things like Boulder County extending its moratorium on drilling, right? Um, and, and saying, okay, we're gonna, you know, take, take some time, draft some, some new local regu regulations. Um, we're going to, to kind of push this to be, to be more restrictive. Meanwhile, in, in neighboring Weld County, um, we saw that the um, county commissioners uh, sort of immediately said, okay, well, if SB 181 is telling us that we have control, we will, don't even wanna follow the state's regulations and we would like to make, um, make it easier. Um, to uh, develop um, oil and gas resources um, in, within, within our county, right? And so the question is, um, you know, in addition to just creating, again, more sort of um, uh, you know, differences in, in where uh, oil and gas is happening, you know, does this exacerbate environmental justice issues um, depending on, you know, who, um, you know, the composition of those counties and, and um, who ends up being um, most affected by, um, by the, by the uh, development that occurs. 
So that local control, I think, could be could be somewhat of a mixed bag, and, and we'd like to to follow that um, that story as it unfolds. Um, <clears throat> Meanwhile, you know, this has been sort of um, rolling out and we've seen that uh, the, um, the other thing that, that the uh, SB 181 prompted was a whole series of new rules that, are, that need to be promulgated by the COGCC. Um, so those draft rules, um, one set of draft rules was uh, released in March around the mission change and what that was going to look like across the, the regulations. Um, hearings were delayed due to COVID, um, but they've uh, picked up um, more recently. Um, this is uh, some, some sort of, uh, you know, an initial take uh, on those draft rules that were uh, submitted or, or um, released in March um, from Conservation Colorado. And so they saw some, you know, some things that they really liked in those rules, um, including some, some increased setbacks, um, some different locations um, or sort of different rules around um, alternative location analysis, um, public in, uh, involvement, uh, and testing water impacts. However, they also saw some things that they thought needed to be improved. Again, these are draft rules. These are not the, the final approved rules, but these are sort of the, the initial draft that was released uh, in March. And, and one of the things that they, they particularly uh, focused on was a need to focus on environmental justice, to um, define and um, clarify um, which communities were disproportionately impacted um, by these rules. Um, so then uh, as this unfolded in, um, in June, uh, you know, another thing that happened with, uh, with, this, with this rule, um, with this bill was that um, it actually changed the composition, not only the mission, but also the composition of the commission. So before uh, SB 181, um, the, uh, the commission was required to, to include three members who had a substantial in, uh, experience in the oil and gas industry. Um, following SB 181, that's reduced. So there's one industry representative, and then there has to be one member with uh, expert, expert experience in wildlife protection, um, another with environmental protection experience, um, someone else who uh, has ex uh, experience in public health. And so it really kind of diversified the voices on that commission. And, uh, and then there, there were sort of uh, revisions to those draft rules and a series of, hearing, uh, of rulemakings, which are still, um, still ongoing. Um, and actually one of the things that we saw was, uh, as I noted, Conservation Colorado was saying, you know, we really wanna see more um, language in here regarding disproportionately impacted communities. And uh, actually lo and behold, that, that is now in the proposed rules. Um, so this is language directly from um, an earlier draft that these have now been revised, but um, back in, in August, um, this was some language that was uh, noting sort of the criteria for identifying what a disproportionately impacted community, um, how that would be identified. And then there was some, um, some rules around, you know, what happens um, if, uh, if a site is proposed um, in proximity to a disproportionately impacted community. So I mentioned earlier that I've had some sort of guides um, on this process and um, one of them, Matt Samuelson and, and another team of, of folks um, asked me if I would provide some expert testimony um, in, these, uh, in these rulemakings. Um, and so that was a new experience for me and I got to, to sort of um, have a, a hearing of course over Zoom um, given the current state of the, the world that we live in. Um, but I was able to, uh, to kind of comment on these proposed rules, specifically these rules around um, disproportionately impacted communities. Um, another side note, you know, another thing that I've been involved in recently is uh, I'm on the advisory committee for um, the state's climate equity framework, which is actually doing very similar things around trying to identify which um, communities are disproportionately impacted both by climate change and by policies that are, are meant to address climate change um, and how uh, we can, um, you know, make more equitable climate policy. And so, you know, given sort of that shared experience across those two projects, I was able to make some recommendations. Um, one of the recommendations had to do with uh, sort of that, that issue of scale. So I don't know if you noticed on the previous slide, but there was sort of some inconsistency with talking about defining, um, you know, using block group for some parts of the definition and then census tract um, for other parts. And um, I guess one thing that one takeaway that I had is that, you know, I kind of said, you know, I think we should be using the same 
um, the same unit and, and preferably the smallest unit possible. So that census block group um, across all these definitions. Um, and the commission was very open to that. We had a really um, engaged back and forth and, and I think they've actually moved in that direction now with the revised rules. Um, so, um, you know, I think uh, these are just a couple of news articles sort of reporting on some of the, the, the um, these rulemaking hearings that have been ongoing. And, and I think all of us uh, who have been watching that are really seeing um, a, a, a major shift in um, in openness to um, considering um, considering environmental racism explicitly in these rules um, to potentially you know increasing those those setbacks so so I think we are really going to see some some major shifts um, in policy as we as we go forward um, so just to kind of um, right before I, I wrap, wrap up here I just kind of want to give you this sort of last sense of where we're headed with this project. Um, so I, I already talked about sort of these space, spatial data sets that we're gonna be looking at um, to address these uh, distributive justice um, questions. We're also gonna be conducting a local decision maker survey across the state to be um, sort of a, a more systematically um, collecting information on, for example, you know, which areas are, um, you know, are enacting um, moratoria or you know, pushing to, um, to have less restrictive policies um, and sort of looking at the, the different tools that are being used in communities and how that might be changing. Based on those kind of statewide analyses, we're gonna select some case study sites. Um, what we plan to do is, is select some neighboring jurisdictions that might have some, some differences in the way that they're addressing this. So that Boulder and Weld County example, um, you know, could, could, be, could be one of those. And, then we'll be doing in those case study areas, um, household surveys, looking at these questions of um, information disparities and impacts on housing choices, uh, as well as some mixed method qualitative work to look at you know, who's participating um, and um, how decisions are, are you know, kind of who's involved in that decision-making process at multiple levels. And we're really focused on engaging um, both with communities and with policymakers at various scales throughout this process. Um, I you know, kind of mentioned earlier that you know environmental justice. I think those of us who are who are doing environmental justice research, research have to come to terms with the fact that this is not just research. It's also it is also um, you know really addressing these sort of fundamental social movements and, and questions of justice. And so we really want to make sure that our work is. Um, responsive to and, um, and engaged with, um, with folks who are directly impacted, um, as well as with people who are, are really making decisions that affect these outcomes, again, at, at various different scales. Um, we're also really in, uh, committed to education, and, and so I just want to kind of end on this note in saying that we really love to have um, students involved um, in this project. We already have uh, mentioned the, the work looking at schools and how, um, how close schools are to development, and I think we're going to be having um, a master's of public health student in our in our school um, conducting that work as part of uh, her capstone for her um, for her master of public health um, degree and and we're really open to to having students engaged in this work in a variety of different ways so I really um, encourage it encourage folks to to reach out if you're interested um, in getting involved this is a three year project and we're kind of just just getting started so um, I will end there and um, open it up for questions. And Julie, are you going to be kind of moderating questions for me? Is that the, the plan? Yes, yes, that is the plan. Okay, perfect. Um, well, on behalf of everyone um, in the Environmental Engineering Department, we want to thank you so much for your talk. Um, it looks like a lot of the participants were really excited and asked a lot of wonderful questions. Um, so to start, uh, one question was, uh, do you believe it would be effective for more public health officials, scientists, and engineers to speak, to seek out positions in local and state governments to protect health and the environment? Specifically, how can people with technical backgrounds and um, engineers and geologists make a larger contribution to the general public? That's a fantastic question. I really like that people are thinking that way. Um, Yes, I mean, that, that's my short answer is yes, I think, I think people should be getting involved at all different levels. I think it's also really important, right, that, um, you know, when, when we think about political engagement, it's not just, you know, 
the national level, there's so much that happens in these in these local um, in these local areas, and you know, including under SB 181, right, saying that that you know, there's it's kind of putting even more power into those local city councils and um, and and county commissioners, and and so I think that um, you know, as I've been um, doing this work, and, and as I said, sort of thinking thinking more and more about how to um, engage effectively, you know, do high quality um, academic work, but but really um, also, you know, use my expertise um, to be an informed and, and active citizen um, on, on issues that, that, you know, really speak to my values. Um, and so, you know, I have chosen um, not to run for, for political office. Um, my husband actually has, he's on the Louisville City Council. And so um, that's been an interesting kind of um, uh, way of, of just, you know, again, just kind of demystifying that, that political experience that it's it really, um, um, it takes, it's, you know, a lot of just, just normal, normal people. Um, so, so yeah, I'd absolutely encourage you to look into that. I think there are, you know, organizations that, um, uh, that have, you know, uh, are, are formed to give guidance to scientists, for example, how, on, on how to engage, again, both, both through, um, you know, not through running for office themselves or through supporting campaigns or engaging in, um, you know, testifying at hearings. Um, there's, there's various different ways to, to get involved. And I, I really do think it's, you know, um, it's not a time to be sitting on the sidelines. Um, so. Thank you. Yes, I agree. It's not the time to be sitting on the sidelines. So another question that someone had, um, it's, they said, in analyzing procedure, procedural justice, has there been work to analyze the demographics of activists and individuals um, contacting and participating in state rulemaking and local city councils? Is there a way to analyze whose voice is being heard and factored into decisions? Yeah. Um, so yes, that is a question that that a lot of people are very interested in. Um, you know, the it, a lot of it comes down to the question of, of data and and so um you know for example um it's very easy to you know to look at what organizations have you know registered as a party to a rulemaking that's part of the process if you want to um, kind of formally um uh provide input um that that's sort of one of the steps and so you you can you can do that um again we don't always have then you know demographics on on the on those individuals or on the membership of those organizations and so it sometimes takes you know a little bit more digging and um you know i, I think this is a place where you know sort of the um a journalistic approach to both you know the, the research and and sort of reporting on these things is really helpful because it does it kind of takes this you know digging in um but but yeah i think that's that's um that's definitely um a key question I think it's also really hard, right? And, and this is something that in the in the rulemaking hearing, you know, what we want is so so, so the second part, like you know, who participates, I think is the easier question to to answer, right? Who shows up, who's um, who's a party to the rulemaking, who comments, who shows up at a city council meeting, right? There, there are kind of various ways to look at at that who's in the room. But the question of who has an impact, right, is is I think a lot more tricky. And in some of the the conversations that that I had when I testified at the COGCC, you know, one of the, the one of the, the questions was, so say okay, you say yes, this is a disproportionately impacted community, therefore you have to do X Y Z. Um, how do we make that X Y Z not just boxes that that somebody can check, right? But but something that actually, um, you know, how how do you sort of um, mandate meaningful participation that has an outcome on the process? That's really tricky. Um, I think there there are um, you know at least wait ways to move more in that direction. So um, you know one of the things that I that I had recommended um, was you know sort of having to submit you know a list of the concerns that the community raised and what specifically um, the the industry did to address each of those concerns. Um, so so I think that there are, there are ways to do it, but it's um, but it's tricky and it's definitely um, hard to say at the end of the day. It's also kind of one of the reasons that it's it's hard often to prove that a company had racist intent in citing, uh, you know, this well next to the Bella Romero Academy because they can point to, you know, all kinds of different um, technical factors and, and various other things, right? 
and they can say, well, you know, it, it's just it's just really hard to to prove that um, that intent, which is why I think you know some of these um, measures that say, well, it doesn't really matter what your intention is if you're citing near disproportionately impacted community, you know, you've got to go through this process and you've got to have a, a heightened level of scrutiny for that. Yeah, that makes sense. It sounds like um, that there's that. It's, I do see how there would be a big um, difference between intent and actually what actually happens. So another question that uh, we wanted to ask is, um, and again, these questions are all um, things that students submitted from the Q&A box. We're just uh, keeping them anonymous. And uh, to what extent is this analysis in Colorado transferable to other states and regions? How does Colorado's work in environmental justice compare to other states? That's a really great question as well. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that we have um, uh, you know, a, a wide range of, of folks who are advising us in this work. And, and the three academic advisors, um, Kirk um, Jalbert, who's at the University of, or he's at Arizona State, um, Jill Johnston at, at um, University of Southern California and um, Drew McCannowitz, who's at Harvard. One of the reasons that we chose that advisory committee to be located outside of Colorado um, was particularly for this reason, so that you know they have they have expertise, um, all of them um, related to um, to oil and gas development and and sort of the study of these of these issues. Um, and and they've they've done work in you know in, in other areas in California and Pennsylvania, um, and so what we're hoping you know I think I think this is another thing that's really important. Um, one thing um, that I've heard folks talk about you know when you're doing community engaged research or when you're doing um, you know research that that really is trying to be um, as tied in and responsive to um, a particular area. Um, is that you know there there has to be an acknowledgement that that area is going to be different, right? And so it's um, and and the particular findings and, and even the the approach that you take is going to have to take into consideration you know what works for that particular area. So I, I think we're not after you know our goal is not ultimately to say well we find this in Colorado therefore you know this finding is going to apply and be generalizable to the entire country. Um, I've heard um, uh, folks talk about the difference between generalizable and transferable research. Um, and the, the way that I've heard that distinction um, made is that generalizable kind of says, well, you know, this case is sort of a representative case. And so we can say its findings apply other places, um, which again, I think is, is often very tricky, especially when you're, when you're trying to be very um, community embedded in, in your work. Transfer, transferable research might say, here are some approaches that we took, here are some lessons that we learned. Um, and so there might be lessons that we could take, um, for example, you know, on this process question, right? If we're seeing really different answers on our question of, you know, are disproportionately impacted communities um, more likely to be in proximity to development when we look at the data, you know, at the census tract level versus, you know, using these birth record data that might be something that could be transferred to a different state to see if those same kinds of um, distinctions or, or you know, differences apply in different areas. So I think that's kind of where, where we're going for is to try and um, learn what we can from, from what folks have done in other places um, and, and then have our um, methods and, and findings be um, relevant to, to folks doing similar work in other places without you know, saying that Colorado is the, you know, the only place that matters or the, you know, that our, that our results apply everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we're going to end with one more question, um, which is based on your research, do you foresee the EPA's update about, oh, and subsequent reduction to section 401 of the Clean Water Act disproportionately affecting marginalized and lower income communities ability to refuse pipelines? Can you repeat that question? It's a little complicated. Problem. Um, based on your research, do you foresee the EPA's update and subsequent reduction to Section 401 of the Clean Water Act disproportionately affecting marginalized and lower income communities' ability to refuse pipelines? Yeah, so I will um, be upfront about the fact that I'm not um, completely familiar with that. Um, will change. I know that there's been a lot of movement um, and shift at the EPA and, and my, my uninformed um, um, but 
probably not inaccurate guess is yes. <laughs> um, I think that, um, you know, I, I think this is something that we've really seen as a very consistent pattern um, under this administration is um, a real disregard for, for these questions of, of justice, environmental justice um, specifically. Um, I think that, um, yeah, there's just been, you know, real, a real push to, to prioritize industries um, interests over those of, of communities and over those of, um, you know, of communities of color and, and um, you know, disadvantaged communities more, more broadly. Um, and so, you know, I'm hoping that that, um, that, that changes. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there, there are reasons to be hopeful. There are folks doing really great work. Um, you know, Colorado has been, uh, again, doing, um, I, I think, you know, uh, has given us several reasons to be hopeful, um, certainly with, uh, with SB 181. So I hope that, um, you know, I think one thing that maybe I can just close with is that I do hear from, um, from students that, um, that, you know, studying environmental issues, um, often the message that you're given is that this is just a hot mess and it's your job to fix it. Um, and I'm not gonna say that's not, that's not true in some, in some respects, but, I think what what um, what all of us who who really are committed to fixing these problems need to understand is that none of us have to fix these problems on our own. Um, and so I think that was one of the reasons I really want to highlight in this talk the work that um, community organizations are doing, the work that you know policymakers here in Colorado are doing. Um, so so there definitely are um, hopeful pathways forward, and um, and I think uh, you know they're the you know, the task then is to, um, is to seek those out and to, to, find, to find your team um, and, uh, and get to work. Well, Dr. Dickinson, thank you so much for being here and giving your talk. I have to say that even though we can't see the participants, we know that there's a lot of um, young people who are very passionate about the environment and justice. You are an inspiration to us all and all of us who want to make the world a more just place. And yeah, we just really appreciate you coming. Uh, this has definitely been the highlight of our Monday. And um, I just wanted to give one last announcement, which is that um, everyone here, uh, next month we will hear for doc from Dr. Adrienne Katner about her research on drinking water infra infrastructure inequality. Uh, mark your calendars for October 19th at 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. And thank you again for being here, Dr. Dickinson. And thank you to everyone <laughs> who uh, planned and contributed and helped um, lead this wonderful talk and series. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs>